Y'all think we don't know what you mean when you say DEI? We know what you mean. We know what you mean. <laughs> we know what you mean. When it comes to our values, the earth is moving under our feet. Contentment has been replaced by a mad dash for supreme self-fulfillment. The year is 2024 and normal men are oppressive patriarchs while abusive women are self-actualized queens. Tonight in New Normal, posting your domestic abuse on social media. And we're gonna talk about how today's youth rebellion looks less like a rowdy sock hop and more like a Maoist youth rally. We're gonna to talk to a man who left the Antifa movement and he says this show is a big part of the reason why he did. We'll have these stories and much more tonight on Disaffected. Utopian, Burlington, Vermont. This is the show where we look at politics, culture, and relationships through a psychological lens. It's April 6, 2024. I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is Disaffected. Let's go. Female domestic abuse perpetrated on men is not taken seriously. Because men are physically stronger, we think they can just leave. But it's really mental chains that keep people in abusive relationships often. It's not always the threat of a beating. And bad female behavior is so normalized in public in our era, and it's praised, that we're now seeing blatant domestic abuse recorded and put on social media for attention. Take a look and a listen. Who has the best girlfriend ever? I do. Who just bought you all this stuff? She did. And all the stuff? My girl bought all of it and I'm about to eat this and then we're gonna chow on that after. So, I have mm. these two. Yeah, <laughs> but we're not eating it all. Just know that, cause we gotta save some. Yeah. You know, budget cuts, you know? <laughs> Happy save, save, save. You know? So we're gonna scoff this stuff down. Cause, Relax. Cause Boo deserved it. <laughs> you know? Even though we get in our arguments sometimes, I still love you, okay? I love you too. Yeah. I love you too, baby. Y yeah, you, you better. <laughs> so I just spent some money on you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you better. Cause I just spent some money on you, yeah? By the way, she looks like what you would expect her to look like. I should have actually brought a picture for you guys. But yes, she's morbidly obese. Yes, she uses Instagram filters on her social media to give her little devil horns. Yes, she's got danger makeup on and borderline glasses. She looks as you would expect her to. This young man is terrified. Look at the fear in his eyes. Listen to the timidity in his voice. Look how he's hunched over. His body language is protective. He's fawning and he's being a good boy because he doesn't want to get hit. This is what cluster B can look like at home and this is what it can look like when the woman is the dominant abuser. Budget cut, save, 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 you know? I just bought you some stuff. There's, I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's something disturbing and off about the tone of voice that she's using when she talks to him. I recognize him. I, I don't know quite how to describe it, but I recognize it personally. I've heard it before many, many times at home. And a lot of things may be going on for this young man. A lot of things may have gone on in his past. He may have been raised by an abusive mother or an abusive father, although I would, I'd put my money on the abusive mother side of the equation. He might be on the autism spectrum. He might be naturally timid and shy. He might be a combination of all of these things. 
But I think it's pretty likely that he was treated this way by a parent when he was a child. And that's why he's chosen to mate up with somebody who replicates what he's used to. She says, look at all the things I bought you. Look what I did for you. This is a way that some women emasculate their men. Now, if he's not working and he's capable of working, then he should be. I don't know what their situation is at home, but this is not a healthy way to work out issues if someone in the household is not pulling their weight. And, you know, for her, she may actually like it that way because it gives her control, lets her say, I'm the big breadwinner. I do everything for you. And actually, he may be more comfortable being bossed around and abused this way because it's familiar to him. And it may add to his belief that he's not capable. He might be stuck in a cycle that he hasn't thought himself out of yet. But it's, it's disturbing to be, it's disturbing because it's so personally familiar. She's pushing him to shore up her narrative. She wants to show off to people about what a good provider girlfriend she is, all the things she's done for him, why he deserves her, or uh, why she, <laughs> I'm getting mixed up here, why she deserves praise from him and why he is so lucky to have her. And then at the end, that creepy part, even though we get in our arguments, sometimes I still love you. It's kind of like an insurance policy. It doesn't sound sincere to me. He says, I love you too. And she says, you better. My mother's husband is like this. At least he was the last time I talked to them eight years ago. The man is disabled. He's very timid. He's got some mental problems and he's a pushover. It's not all he is, but he is those things. He came from a background of extraordinary child abuse, poverty, and deprivation. And he's obviously comfortable with my mother's mind games and screaming tirades. Near the end, eight years ago, when I finally put them out of my life, my mother had gotten to the point of threatening her husband with violence, physical violence, and then bragging about it to other family members. And as the kids say, I brought the receipts in the form of text messages. Take a look at this from my mother to another family member talking about it. She says, I put a hole in the wall yesterday. It was surprising to both of, it was surprising to both of us. It's that or Ed, Ed is her husband. And the context behind this that I don't have for you is uh, that that hole in the wall got put there because she threw a frying pan. My other family member says, oh, my God, Mom, do you need more tapestries? Mother, Mr. Passive Aggressive, thankfully, it's under the calendar, the hole. This was my apartment, by the way, that she decided to put holes in the wall to and cover up with the calendar, not tell me. Other family member responds, I have no idea what to say. My mother just continues. I screamed as loud as I could coming back from the store tonight on an unfamiliar street. He is useless when I ask him for help in the car like a steady, reassuring person. Just telling you what my last 20 years, I'm going with him to his counselor on Tuesday. And finally, he brought nothing good to me. I've done everything. And now I see that personality disorder for what it is. That's all. I'm taking back my life. As you see, my mother is very comfortable diagnosing other people with personality disorder. She did it to my sister. She did it to her husband. She did it to me. My mother, of course, in my view, has both borderline and narcissistic personality disorders. And this text exchange, these are the words of an allegedly grown up and mature, mature 61 year old woman. I tried to rescue my mother's husband at the end when I was throwing them out of the house because I was actually afraid for his physical safety. When I called and, and offered him an escape route, he turned around and put it back on me. He started screaming profanities at me, he called me an abuser, he told me I was crazy, told me I'd ruined my mother's life. So what I would say to anybody, if you have a friend like this young man who's being abused this way, it probably works this way with women too, but don't have firm set expectations 
if you try to help a friend in this situation. Be prepared that he or she may turn on you. Sometimes the devil you know is the one you want to stick with. And maybe that'll change in the future. But you have to be willing, you have to be willing to extend the helping hand to, to do the right thing for its own sake, even if you get flack from the person that you're trying to help. And then you have to be able to let it go. It's not gonna feel great, but that's the way it works sometimes. Euthanasia has been in the news a lot lately. Countries like Canada even have a cute name for it, MAID, M-A-I-D, Medical Assistance in Dying. Euphemisms. Euphemisms are so useful to people who wanna do evil. MAID, Physician Assisted Suicide, whatever you wanna call it, it started out as something that seemed merciful to people who were dying in unbearable pain from terminal illnesses. I supported it for a long time because of that. But it's crept along now until in some countries, you could get medical assistance in dying because of mental illness, depression, autism, or personality disorders, mental problems. And it seems that all you have to do in the Netherlands now is say that you're terminally unhappy and the state is ready to palliate you. This is a, a brief video, brief description of a story about a woman named Zoraya Turbeek. She's 28 years old and she's been diagnosed with both autism, uh, autism, major depression, and borderline personality disorder. And this short, um, this short video comes courtesy of the author of the Substack, The Free Press. That's Barry Weiss's outfit. Um, let's uh, actually, now first, let's, let's take a look. Hello, my name is Soraya and I'm 28 years old. I live in the Netherlands and recently my euthanasia request for my mental suffering got approved. Zoraya Turbeek is 28 and she expects to be euthanized in early May. She is one of a growing number of people across the West choosing to end their lives rather than live in pain. Pain that in many cases can be treated. Zoraya once had ambitions to become a psychiatrist but she was never able to muster the will to finish school or start a career. She says she was hobbled by her depression and autism and borderline Understood. personality disorder. Now she was tired of living, despite, she said, being in love with her boyfriend, a 40-year-old IT programmer, and living in a nice house with their two cats. She recalled to me her psychiatrist telling her that they had tried everything, that, quote, there's nothing more we can do for you. It's never going to get any better. At that point, she said she decided to die. Quote, I was always very clear that if it doesn't get better, I can't do this anymore. In 2022, the most recent year for which there is data, Dutch officials recorded 8,720 cases of euthanasia, a 13.7% increase from 2021, when there were 7,666 cases. To put this in perspective, there were a total of 170,100 deaths in the Netherlands in 2022, meaning euthanasia cases comprised more than 5% of all deaths. Now, typically, when we think of people who are considering assisted suicide, we think of people facing terminal illness. But this new group is suffering from other syndromes. Depression or anxiety exacerbated, they say, by economic uncertainty, the climate, social media, and a seemingly limitless array of fears and disappointments. I spoke to a healthcare ethics professor who served for a decade on a euthanasia review board in the Netherlands from 2005 until 2014. He told me in those years he saw, quote, the Dutch euthanasia practice evolved from death being a last resort to death being a default option. He ultimately resigned. For my story for the free press, I investigate whether suicide, assisted dying, and euthanasia are a sign of human empowerment or a sign that we're in a dystopian world where core human values are disintegrating. You can read, I am 28 and I'm scheduled to die in May at the fp.com. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to make some guesses here. My guess is that with this young woman, we're in a both and situation. 
I do believe she's probably suffering. But I'm not sure how genuine her claim to want to be euthanized actually is. Kevin, can you put up that picture? Yeah. Take a look at this picture on your screen. There were a number of portraits that accompanied uh, this story in the free press. And I, and I looked up a number of other pictures of Soraya, Zariah on social media, and most of them had this quality to them. Is it me or is there something self-satisfied and smug in her facial expression, her perfectly made up and flatteringly lit portrait? I see smugness. I see almost something that looks like Duper's delight. I, they're strange portraits for somebody who's allegedly intent on dying. How much of how much of what she's going through is genuine and how much of this is histrionic attention seeking? Because both can be going on at the same time. They often are. Here's another one. Yeah, you know, she lounges about in bed. Face resting on her on her hand. You know, commentator Matt Walsh said on his show this week that uh, Miss Turbeek has been in the papers for years being covered um, because she has a do not resuscitate order and wants to make sure that everybody knows that if no matter how young she is, if anything happens to her, she absolutely does not want to be saved or brought back to life um, because of her mental illness. Uh, Matt says she's even posed in a wicker coffin that she picked out. Now, um, I generally trust Matt Walsh. His, uh, he doesn't he doesn't usually lie about things, but Internet search has become really screwed up because I went looking and looking uh, for these things. And it is, <laughs> to me, impossible to find anything that's not absolutely current and algorithm favored by Google. It's, it's getting harder and harder to find anything historical, even if historical means just a few years ago. I used to hang around with a lot of people who were um, advocates of physician-assisted suicide. Oh, they, they hate that word. They, they absolutely get angry when you say the word suicide. They want a euphemism. They want aid in dying, right? When people want euphemisms and they get very angry when you describe something plainly, that's an indication that they know there's something wrong with what they're doing, usually, or they want you to perceive what they're doing as something fundamentally different from what it actually is. It's a warning sign. And my support for um, physician-assisted suicide was probably shored up when I had a friend who was dying of cancer uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, it was it was really brutal. It was liver cancer. And by the time my friend was uh, the day he died, he was down to about 80 pounds. You know, when people talk about um, being reduced to being an ambulatory skeleton, that's not a joke. It's actually a literal description. He was an animated skeleton. He was in a tremendous pain. It was horrendous for him and it was horrendous to watch. Um, and what ended up happening was um, we talked with the nurses and said that we wanted to make sure that he had enough morphine on board to take care of the suffering and the pain. And even if we knew that that would hasten his death, we were fine with that. And that is, in fact, what happened. But it wasn't physician assisted suicide. And today, actual sadists and psychopaths are at the top of these euthanasia acceptance programs. They know that there are people like me and many other people out there who have seen loved ones ag have agonizing deaths from cancer and who are soft hearted about it. We want to ease people's suffering so we end up supporting this. And unwittingly, so many normal and caring people are actually doing the work of psychopaths. And many of them are not gonna wake up to this until it's too late, if at all. The same thing is going on in Canada. Here's a story from the Daily Mail. Quote, a judge in Canada has cleared the way for a 27-year-old autistic woman to be euthanized despite objections from her dad, who says she's healthy, just vulnerable due to her mental health problems. In his ruling, Justice Colin Feesby acknowledged that the doctor-assisted death would cause the father profound grief, but said the young woman's right to end her own life trumped his feelings. Alex Schadenberg, who leads the Europe Euthanasia Prevention Coalition Campaign Group, said it showcased the problems with medical assistance in dying. Quote, Canada's euthanasia law 
was not designed to protect vulnerable people, end quote. Uh, the law is designed to protect the doctors who are willing to kill. Next quote, Canada's road to outlawing, excuse me, to allowing euthanasia began in 2015 when its top court declared that outlawing assisted suicide deprived people of their dignity and autonomy. It gave national leaders a year to draft legislation. The resulting 2016 law legalized both euthanasia and assisted suicide for people aged 18 and over, provided they met certain conditions. They had to have a serious advanced condition, disease, or disability that was causing suffering and their death was looming. The law was later amended to allow people who are not terminally ill to choose death, significantly broadening the number of eligible people. I remember when the physician-assisted suicide euthanasia idea first started to take hold in conversations in my political circles in the U.S. I was there for it. I went to talks. I signed petitions. I don't support this any longer. I do support palliative care. I do support comfort care aggress as aggressively as possible. There's something called the doctrine of double effect, which means in this example, um, if you give enough morphine to really take care of a cancer patient's pain, that dose may also have the effect of hastening the death. Um, I'm comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with explicit physician-assisted suicide because everything the euthanasia advocates promised, and I was there, I heard those promises. I heard them in person. Everything they promised that got me on board initially has been overridden. They promised that it would only be for impending deaths. They promised that it would only be for the terminally ill. They promised that there would be safeguards. I believed them. Millions of people believe them still. They are now lying. All right. How about you? Do you need somebody to talk to about an abusive situation? Because if you do, I'm your guy. You can book a one hour conversation with me, a consulting session at joshuaslocum.net. If you need a sounding board for issues about narcissism, fractured families, bullying at work, and more, I'd love to help you see your situation clearly, walk through you with it, and also walk through your options so that we can look at them together realistically as you do the work of deciding which path you're gonna take out. So if you would like to have some time, go on over to joshuaslocum.net. I'd love to help you if I can. And disaffected supporters get a discount as well. We're gonna be going to a break, but when we come back, we are going to talk with a young man who used to be part of Antifa and who walked away from it. And he says that this show is part of the reason why he did. We'll see you then. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio-only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform, so make sure you subscribe today. Welcome back. We are going to have a conversation with Ty King. He is an audience member of the show. Sent us an email and has a very interesting story. Ty walked away from Antifa, and he says that this show had something to do with it. Ty, welcome. Hi, Josh. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much for getting in contact with us. We're going to go for about 20 minutes here in anticipation of a longer, full one-hour show that you and I are going to do on audio. So let's, um, let's get into it a little bit. Um, you told me that you... Um, you had a similar story, a similar childhood story to mine, not exactly the same, but that you had abusive parents. And as you know, I draw a connection between the child abuse that I experienced and how I was raised and my eventual joining up with hard left, woke, extreme politics. Do you see a connection between the way you were raised as a child and where you ended up politically joining Antifa? Yes, but with a more nuanced perspective on it. So it wasn't my parents that were abusive. It was my father and my mother and my father 
weren't together from age well from age three onwards but uh it was me who reinitiated contact with my father who was supposed to be no contact with me until i was age 18 but uh i reached out to him on facebook so my abuse for me began out of age 15 16 after i had two really great parents who did their best did everything put everything into me despite the fact i was a troubled child and then suddenly i'm being sent to the other side of the state and i'm living with somebody who i didn't realize at all was the monster that he was. Um, so let me let me ask for clarification. Um, when when you were a young child, are you saying that your your actual father was not part of your life when you were a young child? No, uh, my mother divorced from him at age three. We lived in Virginia at the time, and then she moved us to West Texas whenever I was three because he became psychotic and abusive, uh, displaying a lot of the tendencies you tend to talk about on the show, drug and alcohol abuse. Um, he had gotten in trouble in the military, locked up in the brig a couple of times. You know, the kind of guy who would go and throw his captain's off, uh, his officer's uniforms into the freaking river whenever they were going on, on missions. Uh, just completely mentally unstable, violent. And she had a great escape and took me with her. And she married my adopted father, Joseph King, about a year later. Okay. And uh, I didn't realize how good I had it. So what ended up happening at 15? Uh, so I was a really troubled youth. We grew up in Odessa, Texas, which was really ghetto, really trash, a lot of violence, sex, drugs, just not a great environment to keep a kid. So uh, my adopted father, he wanted to take us and move us to North Texas because he worked for the post office and he wanted better opportunity. So we went and did that. But I, I think I was already troubled. There was already a lot of Odessa that had tainted me. And I pushed my parents to the point where they just didn't know what to do with me. And I had secretly been communicating with my father for about half a year to a year before telling my parents. And I think about a year or two following that, maybe uh, that's when my mom had enough after we had a violent outburst in the house. And she was just like, you take him. Like, I don't know what to do anymore. When you say violent outburst, who was doing the violence? Was it you or your mom or somebody else? Me. I what, was, did you, uh, what did you do? Often, uh, you know, getting in fights with family and friends. Um, the night that we blew up, I had a neighbor girl um, that I got in a fight with, and she was trying to tell my little brother that I was smoking cigarettes, which I was, but I didn't want my little brother to see me in that light. So I started screaming at her and cussing her and treating her like shit and uh, stormed out the house yelling at her and her parents were with my parents in the front yard and I'm calling her a cunt and a whore and a bitch and fuck you and you deserve to die and her family's just like what the fuck is going on and my mother uh, called my father up at that point crying and was just like I, I don't know what to do do you do you now that you look back on it do you do you know where do you have any idea where that anger was coming from or at least in part I think definitely not having like, well, I had a father figure in the house to be sure, but not my <laughs> biological father. Um, but also from uh, sixth grade onwards, I was dosed with all sorts of medication. Well, Butrin, Concerta, Abilify, everything you can possibly put in a kid. The school said you need to get him doped up or he's going to be expelled. And I got put in a mental hospital for about three weeks in sixth grade as well. So I was just constantly on all sorts of medication. Sometimes it would feel like it would change every couple of weeks. Sometimes it felt like it would change every couple of days. But that's only because time just – there's so many blocks of my childhood that come back to me because it's just like – I realize I spent most of my childhood high. Okay. The first time I ever started doing drugs, I was just like, holy shit, this is kind of familiar. So I think oh, that played a large part in it. That's a hell of a thing to have to realize, isn't it? It's not you fun. Know, the, the, the amount of drugs that they will put younger and younger children on now shocks me. I mean, I was a teenager when I was put on antidepressants. And, and that, that was, you know, in those days considered quite young. But um, it was much earlier for you. Um, now, let's talk about Antifa. When did you join Antifa? I want to say 2019, 2020. So it was probably only a year, maybe two years at most. But there was also times that I was going into protest prior. That okay. How, how old were you when you first joined up with them or started hanging around with them? It's 2019. I would have been 22, 23. Okay. So I think it would have been 23 in uh, 2020. So what to, I'm, I'm going to ask you, there's a couple parts to this question that's all related. What drew you? to Antifa. And part of that is 
<clears throat> what what how were they able to seduce you? What did you think they were? And can you identify anything that made you particularly receptive or vulnerable to being conscripted by an extremist political group? Absolutely. Um, the thing that drew me to it was, um, I'll give you a couple answers on that. A, it was there. You know, being in Eugene, Oregon, like you can just walk downtown and boom, you can be a part of things. Uh, the other side of that is growing up with the wars in the Middle East, with the Bush administration, with the Obama administration, watching all this military expansion, watching all these people die, watching all these bombs be dropped. You spend your entire life when you're born in 1997 and most of your perception is post 9-11 wondering when the hell are people going to step in and do something about this? And I saw Antifa as that because as much as the left wants to scream about conspiracy theorists and militancy and all this, most of that was on the right. Those were the ones, those were the, or sorry, on the left. Those were the ones who were talking about 9-11 and government corruption and big pharma and all of that. And I saw Antifa as being a direct way to get involved and to counter the police who were militarized by the Obama administration. I remember during the Obama era watching train after train after train of tanks and SUVs and weapons caches and in some cases even coffins for some reason. And it was just like these were going to police stations all over the country. So I've been horrified since this, since I was in high school. So I guess for me in that moment with everything going on, all the crazy things in the world, it was just like, this is it. They're finally doing it. I have to be a part of this. Let's go get the president of the United States. Fuck Donald Trump. Okay. <laughs> all right. That's the whole package wrapped up for us. Thank you. <laughs> um, would you say that... Because I see, I see Antifa as, a, as an extremist political group, uh, verging on a terror group uh, in, in much of their actions. Um, and I see, I see this connection. I see so many people who join up with extremist politics. I didn't join Antifa, um, but I had my own version of, 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 of joining up with, um, with groups like, like that, although they were not involved in violent protests. Uh, and I absolutely see a thread between my unstable and troubled childhood and finding meaning and purpose and belonging in the political set. Do you believe that that happened for you as well? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, one of the things that I think drew me to Antifa as far as the people that I think your show highlights so well is the trauma bonding. The, uh, I want to come in and demystify what Antifa is. You know, people want to think of it as just like a bunch of kids sitting around building pipe bombs. It's people with traumatic backgrounds. It's people who were touched by their daddies, who were beat, who were treated like absolute garbage. People who, when you know, I'm sitting in a room with them, I can sit down and be like, same, same, same. I feel that. I understand that. And it creates an environment of just everybody kind of meshing together and living in their trauma. <clears throat> Well, I agree uh, because I've ha I've had a very similar experience. Um, you know, you if you're if you're somebody like me, somebody like you, somebody like the people you know, you often wake up or or you take a notice one day. You look around at the people who are your friends, the people who show up at the meetings you go to, or part of the clubs you're part of, and you say, "Gosh, they're so they're so similar. Everybody's got a tale of." You know, my dad abandoned the family or my mother was unstable and never held a job and freaked out on us kids. Or I was bounced from foster home to institution uh, to juvenile hall or I was sexually abused or I was physically abused or I was mentally abused. And of course, birds of a feather flock together. We tend to find each other. People of similar backgrounds tend to self-select uh, into groups with each other. Um, and, and I think for me, what what's so disturbing, I didn't realize it was disturbing when it was going on. I didn't know when I was in the middle of it that my vulnerabilities, my unresolved, um, I, I, I know these words sound kind of trite, but unresolved childhood trauma had really left me open to, I was very receptive to a group or a political ideology that said, we have the solution. We've identified the boogeyman. We've identified the villain. And, and if we all work together to overthrow this villain, then this bad, terrible world will all be taken care of. And I allowed myself to be led along by a number of Pied Pipers uh, in extreme leftist politics that made that promise. Was there anything similar for you 
uh, in relation to Antifa? A hundred percent. You know, everyone, there's a lot of people in Antifa that want to claim that their family members are white supremacists or their daddies are Nazis. Whenever I went to live with my father, this is how it was for us. I, our house was a tattoo shop. We were the only tattoo shop in town in this small town in South Texas. So we're 24 seven people in and out, in and out. And I'm the assistant. I'm helping sweep up. I'm helping take care of things. Uh, there's instances where I have to keep an eye on a shotgun because we have some dangerous motherfuckers coming through and it's just like, keep an eye on them. Like it was a very crazy situation to jump from you know family that just puts you in the suburbs to do well and then all of a sudden you're around gangs and white supremacists and mexican mafia and what you know all this small town white trash that you start to see the dark side in the underbelly of this so my father was hanging around a lot of white supremacists and ex-white supremacists and was a very very racist and homophobic and rageful and violent and terrifying fucking individual and but in my head i began to believe he was a white supremacist due to the proxy he was allowing himself to get as close as he was you know there was a time where i walked in and he was doing a hitler portrait and i not on somebody i don't think he ever wound up tattooing it but he was drawing it on a piece of paper and i just remember being like what the fuck are you doing but i was so scared scared of it that he was just laughing at it. he's just like look at this this guy might get this done and and i just kind of laughed within him and i'm like okay yeah no that's freaking wild crazy someone would want that on their body but um, rather than take the time to realize that maybe he was just making bad friends and bad connections, uh, you know, when you get into movements like Antifa and you have people in the government and people in these political organizations telling you about how everybody's a Nazi and how it gets into society and how prevalent it is. For someone like me, seeing how prevalent it was in my own personal circle, in my own personal life at that point, it made me feel like it was really everywhere. Like really and truly everywhere until the more and more time went on, you realize that a lot of the stories people were coming up with weren't even remotely close to what I was dealing with at all. And it was well, disrespectful to even suggest. Well, it sounds to me, you know, I, I, from what you describe, it sounds to me that it would have been a reasonable conclusion for you to come to that your father did have white supremacist and racist uh, sympathies. I mean, it, it, it certainly sounds like that. No. Yeah, but it's to the extent of which you take it, because rather I should have gone to therapy and dealt with that. But rather than do that, it's just, you know, it's sounds like you're yeah, saying that, weird you, place to be in. that you extrapolated this this personal experience out and and said much more of the world is like this. It's not just my family. It's it's, you know, everybody out there. Um, so. I guess in a sense, it sounds like your joining up with Antifa was in some way a direct reaction to how you felt about your father. Absolutely. Yeah. It was, was all about father issues. Was he violent to you personally? What was he like? I, what was he like in the home as a father, as a family member? So there was a summer too. I actually went to stay with him before moving with him, and it was great. He would take me to the game store. We go do movies. You know, uh, like look, this is his old chain. He was a juggalo. He loved Star Wars. We loved all the same thing. Marvel, DC, superheroes, like Injustice, whenever that came out, we got it the first day. We would play it every day. Like this dude was my best fucking friend. And then whenever he finally got his hands on me and I was in the home, I wasn't allowed to have friendships. I wasn't allowed to communicate with my mother. I had to uh, tell all my old friends goodbye, specifically was told you are not allowed to communicate with them anymore. All of my communications in and out of the house were monitored. I was not allowed to leave. Everything that I said was listened into. And my father treated me like I was in jail. And he went to jail a couple times. I don't know if he suffered trauma from that. But one of his big moves was he would like grab me and he'd like pin me against the wall, put his arm against my neck and he'd be like in my face breathing and I could see the nostrils and feel his breath, you know, calling me boy and all this shit and fucking just over simple things like questions. I was such a timid kid at that point because I didn't want to I didn't want to upset my father, this man that I had spent my entire life wanting to know. So if anything, I treated him better than anyone else I'd ever treated my entire life. And, and it made no difference in how me. he treated you. None. It Sounds it sounds very cluster B to me. And I mean, this is just a guess. I'm coming in from the outside. I only have a little bit to go on. But the man you're describing sounds like he exhibits traits of, of narcissism and sociopathy. Where would you what would you say? 100 percent and borderline psychopathy, too. You know, this is a man that. I, I still am scared of. I've forgiven, but I haven't forgotten. I recently tried to get back in touch with him sober less than a year ago, and 
it didn't go well. It ended in uh, threats and him commenting on pictures of my minor sister and my mother uh, creeping up on all their social medias, talking to me about all the weapons he was purchasing. This is a man who I feel bad to say it because like Blair White, she talked with her therapist recently in a video and she talks about how she told her father essentially she wished that he would die or kill himself and then it wound up happening. So I know there's a lot of weight to be said with what I said, with what I'm saying, but I will not truly feel safe until my father drops dead of cancer or whatever fucking takes him. And and that's just the reality. I'm a 27-year-old who is still scared of his father despite the fact I'm a country away, basically. You're not alone. You're not alone. There are so many people who come from backgrounds like you did who feel that way. Um, yeah, it's common. Um, we've only got a couple minutes more left. We're gonna, of course, we're going to get into much more detail when we have an, a whole hour uh, to talk with each other about this coming up, and I'll announce that when we're done today. But just briefly, where are you politically today? What have you changed your mind about? Uh, a lot of things. Uh, you know, in a way, I still want to say I'm classically liberal, but I really have skewed more conservative. You know, if you'd asked me a couple months ago, I'd have said, no, nah, I'm not going to vote for Donald Trump. You asked me now, I'm like, yeah, I'm probably going to vote for Donald Trump, even though I really like Kennedy. You know, for all the wishing Donald Trump death, for all the going after him, for all the protesting, it's like, all right, turns out that all the things we thought he did wrong, he didn't do wrong. He was right about a lot of things. There's an insurrection taking place in this country, and it's led by the far left and the communists, and all of our enemies want a piece of our ass now. Because Hi, I'm with you. Our kids are stupid. Like, <laughs> I so know. Like, he was right. <laughs> are you still having you still having that, that sort of revelatory moment where you say, I I'm saying this? I'm saying this thing that I used to make fun of other people for and call them Nazis. <laughs> I would have want myself burned at the fucking stake for this. <laughs> I know. Your old self would kill your new self, right? 100% or sick my friends on me. <laughs> All right. Um, Ty, we're going to wrap this up for today because we're going we're to go into uh, much more detail later this week. And I want to tell all of you who are listening and watching the show, this is a great time for you to sign up to become a supporting member to Disaffected because we're going to have uh, supporting members are going to join us on our Discord this coming Thursday. April 11th at 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. So again, Thursday, April 11th, 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. We're going to be recording an audio-only hour-long show with Ty and have a fuller conversation. And then he's going to stick around afterwards and do some Q&A with the audience members, the disaffected members. So if you want to get in on that, there's a couple of ways to do it. You can sign, best, easiest way to is just sign up at our Substack. Go to disaffectedpod.substack.com, become a paying subscriber there. You can also do it on subscribestar.com slash disaffected. I put the same content up at each place. Ty King, I want to say thank you for joining us. This uh, conversation has whet my appetite and I think it probably has for the audience and I look forward to having some fun with you and the rest of them this coming Thursday. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. We'll see you after the break. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio-only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform, so make sure you subscribe today. It is time once again. Allons-y. Lizzo. Lizzo, Lizzo. So much to love. Well, Lizzo got fed up with just about everything this week and decided to throw a strop. And this is what she said. <clears throat> I'm getting tired of putting up with being dragged by everyone in my life on the Internet. All I want to do is make music and make people happy <clears throat> and help the world be a little better than how I found it. But I'm starting to feel like the world doesn't want me in it.
I'm constantly up against lies being told about me for clout and views, being the butt of the joke every single time because of how I look, my character being picked apart by people who don't know me and disrespecting my name. I didn't sign up for this shit. I quit. Well, harumph. <clears throat> this is what happens when you try to go against reality, Lizzo, and Lizzo handlers. The woke left can scream all it wants that fat is beautiful, and even noticing it is fat phobia. And Lizzo can ride that all the way to the bank, as she's been doing successfully for several years now. But humans can only deny reality for so long, and she brought this on herself. Well, of course, narcissistic celebrities never quit. <clears throat> this is Lizzo later this past week after she said, I quit. I want to make this video because I need to clear. I just need to clarify when I say I quit. I mean, I quit any negative energy attention. <laughs> what I'm not going to quit is the joy of my life, which is making music, which is connecting to people. Really? I thought the joy in your life was standing there with your with your piccolo flute or whatever it is you have in a in a in a half naked bodysuit making everybody say, oh, my God, she's so wonderful because she's enormously fat and also plays the flute. Honestly, you know, in related news, Cher has once again promised to leave the country if Trump is elected. But she said that in 2016, and she's still chilling in her gothic Malibu mansion. I mean, uh, just just go. Just go. <laughs> you know, this came across my screen this week, and it made me bust up. <laughs> When I was a kid, when my brothers and sisters and I watched um, He-Man or She-Ra, two different cartoons, I always wanted to make it a combination show called She-Man, Mastress of the Universe. <laughs> and it looks like other people have had that idea, too. So if you're just listening on audio, this is a mock-up of a, of a He-Man uh, action figure, but it's, it's Troon style. So it <laughs> it's big, muscly He-Man with a blonde page boy, Bob. And that sharp makeup looks like he might have gotten his buckle fat removed, too. <laughs> or is that just the contouring? <laughs> he, them, the Irv Ernverse. <laughs> Whoever made this, I want to be your best friend because you have the same sense of humor I've had since I was 11. <clears throat> you can just picture He-Man. Pretty, pretty. Am I pretty? <laughs> Last week, we told you about a group of Vanderbilt University students that took over the chancellor's office. They were protesting because the school wouldn't let them change the student constitution to stop student government money from supporting any businesses <clears throat> that were connected to Israel. And we showed you that hysterical young woman who was shrieking about how somebody was going to get toxic shock syndrome in their cooch because she couldn't change her tampon quickly enough. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, it's even worse with the young men. Take a listen. Um, I was one of the few students who was arrested last night inside Kirkwood Hall. I just wanna really quickly kind of share my experiences and compare them to what I experienced last night. Uh, again, as people have said, for 21 hours, we were deprived of medical attention. We were deprived of sleep. We were deprived of food, water, resources. And at 5.30 in the morning, I got a pat on my back. I was told to stand up. I was handcuffed and I was escorted out of my own university. I was not told where I was going. I was not, being to I was not told what I was being charged with. It's disgusting that this is how they treat student protesters on this campus. Shame. Shame! I soon arrived to downtown Nashville Police Department. I was taken into bookings. I was processed um, and I was released a few hours later. But I want to comment on something. In jail, I experience better conditions than at Vanderbilt University. I had access to water. I had access to a bathroom. I had access to my friends and the ability to rest. How dare this university deprive us of basic humanity? How dare a top 15, 20 university in this country have more inhumane conditions than... Is that it? 
out of a jail. It's disgusting. We demand that Vanderbilt reinstate the referendum, that they drop all charges against students that were filed under false pretenses, that they drop the suspensions and harassment from administration, and that they issue an immediate apology to what we experienced over the last 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Because enough is enough. <laughs> Look at these masks. Vanderbilt is being shamed all over social media. They are being shamed on this campus. They are being set up to be a mockery on the world stage because of how they are treating us. We are saying no more. Keep fighting, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Keep fighting. Thank you. You know he wants himself an Argentine balcony to declaim from. <laughs> you know, young man, sounds like you had a good time with the police, didn't you? <laughs> you had access to water, access to a bathroom. <laughs> I don't uh, just the lack of proportion, just the lack of proportion is 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 just astonishing. OK, that's your fun for the week. Now back to serious stuff. Actually, you've got some viewer comments, a um, couple of interesting ones that I wanted to share with you. Um, Andrew Stollard, 6927. Uh, this is about last week we, we showed you that uh, teacher, Miss um, Drippin' Honey, uh, who lost her job because she did a rap video on the site. So Andrew says, I'm actually surprised and a bit disturbed Miss Drippin' Fresh got, it's Drippin' Honey, by the way, Drippin' Fresh is my rap name got into trouble for her extracurricular activities. It's not like she's doing anything outlandish by the standards of rap music. To what extent should the off hours of public school teachers be restricted by their employers? Private schools can make their own standards. I'm a teacher and an aspiring novelist. If I was employed in the United States, my existing published work would probably raise a few eyebrows for its political incorrectness, and I would in all likelihood be fired. Uh, another commenter uh, said something similar. Zero... F-U-X given, <laughs> says, about the rapping teacher, I will grant this is the first I've heard of the Detroit rapping teacher, and I'm forming the following opinion based on the information you presented. Barring any additional evidence that may come to light of her promoting her music slash video slash lifestyle in front of her students or at the school more generally, I disagree with her firing. Perhaps it's the lawyer in me, but I strongly advocate for the right to free speech presumption of innocence, though firing on its own is not necessarily a legal matter. The framework or legal system provides can make for good moral policy slash boilerplate. As vulgar as her aesthetic and lyrics may be, I think it's fine for her to present herself that way in her personal time, as long as she's off the clock and not <clears throat> on school grounds. Well, I understand this point of view. Um, here's where I think we disagree. Um, and maybe you'd agree with this if, if we were having a conversation. The standards of rap music have nothing to do with the standards of what a public school teacher should do when she comports herself in public off the job, or he. They are not the same thing. That is not the appropriate yardstick by which to measure this behavior. Yes, it's true that as far as rap music goes, Miss Drip and Honey, Dominique Brown is her name, is certainly less violent, obscene, and vulgar than many rap acts, although what she did was also obscene and vulgar. You know, bitches, hoes, fuck y'all, that sort of stuff. You know, that's, that's vulgar and obscene. Why are we measuring what, whether or not a, a, a teacher should be fired based on the standards of rap music? That, I think, is another example of the modern sickness we have in our culture where we think, well, if this is somebody else's culture, if this is what they do there, then it must be fine in every context. No, it isn't. There's plenty of things that aren't, that are fine in their own context that are not fine for public school teachers. We've talked about this on the show many times. It may be just fine to publish a book like Gender Queer for adults that has all of this obscenity in it, but it is not just because the standards of queer publishing say that's okay, does not mean those standards are okay in a public school. Many teachers and college professors have what are called moral turpitude clauses in their employment contracts. This is not new. It is not new. This is bog standard and has been forever. Um, yes, that can go wrong. 
but it can also go right. There's a reason these things are in place. So I think, you know, a way to look at this is one of these things is not like the other. A provocative published book like um, um, our viewer is not necessarily the same thing as a teacher who's rapping about hoes and bitches and niggas, her words, online where students can easily find it and are likely to easily find it. We don't need to abolish all standards for behavior off site. And we don't have to cancel everyone indiscriminately for outside behavior either. There is a happy medium to be found here, but we find it when we return to standards and discernment, judgment, discrimination. Is this like this or is this not like this? What if a teacher had a nude, well, I say that as if there's any other kind of OnlyFans account. What if a teacher had a nude, uh, sexually explicit OnlyFans account? Some have been fired for that. What if she's explicitly working as a prostitute or an escort? Would you, would you say the same thing? And if not, where is that line? That's what we have to do. We actually have to discuss where the line is and where we disagree about lines. It's not the case that it's black or white and either or. We have to actually make judgments. I think most of us do have a line, but we have to think and talk those lines through with each other and come up with common standards. All right, I wanna end the show uh, with some clarification. Some viewers and some readers, and I say that because there are some people who mainly consume disaffected through the writing that I do on Substack. Um, some of them have communicated to me that they think I've gone too far in what they call supporting Trump or supporting Republicans. They ask basically how I can be such a hypocrite. How does a guy who talks about narcissistic personalities so much end up, in their words, supporting Trump? When people find a writer or a show host or somebody, some minor public figure or major public figure, I'm very minor, uh, that they like, but then they disagree with him or her on something important, they often feel emotionally betrayed. I understand that feeling. Um, I felt it myself. I try to fight it myself by remembering that no one is obliged to agree with every position I take. And of course, I do have to remind myself of this a lot of the time. Let me clarify and lay out my views on Donald Trump as a candidate and on small c conservatism. Number one, I believe Donald Trump is a narcissist. I've been saying this publicly for years, long before I had this show, even back to the days when I was a progressive leftist. Even though I'm a conservative now, I still recognize that Donald Trump is a massive egotist with a huge helping of narcissistic traits. Everybody can see that. What I changed my mind about is how dangerous a narcissist he is in our current political context. I used to think that he was a sadistic Machiavellian figure who would turn literal tyrant and enslave the country and destabilize the world. But that was progressive emotionalism on my part. I think Donald Trump is the kind of narcissist who's more like a child. He's self-centered, he's insecure, he's vain. And he's very biddable by people who flatter him in the right way. On the flip side of the same coin, he instantly casts out people who don't flatter him correctly or who disagree with him publicly. I don't believe that he's unusually sadistic, uh, nor do I believe he has aspirations to be some kind of extra constitutional dictator. I recognize that his narcissistic flaws pose dangers and drawbacks. He's very bad at picking staff, for example, because he's so vulnerable to flattery and sycophancy that it overrides better judgment. We saw that in his cabinet picks. But nearly every other person who gets to the heights of becoming a serious presidential candidate is narcissistic or, you know, has enough of the traits to be called fundamentally a narcissist. Donald Trump isn't unique this way. He happens to have a very brash and unusual style that draws attention and that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. It really rubbed me the wrong way. The aesthetic, the, the accent, the tone of voice. Um, really, it's still not my favorite, but it doesn't bother me nearly as much as it did before. I recognize that I was, he was pinging off other things that didn't have to do with the substance of what he said. But others take Barack Obama as an example, also a narcissist. And I would say Barack Obama is far more dangerous and Machiavellian than Trump is. They're covert. 
this kind of narcissist. They disguise their character with smooth speech, and they claim that they're working to bend the moral arc toward justice. And this shuts down critical faculties on people who want to hear that message. Joe Biden is a narcissist, a pathological liar. I think he's fundamentally cruel. And really, I mean, he's, and it's actually his administration that's doing this because he's in obvious mental decline. He's far more dangerous to the body politic, I think, than Donald Trump is. Everything I worried, the severity of the consequences I worried about in 2016, thinking that Trump would do them, Biden has actually done them or worse things. Biden's economic policies, his border policies, his support for mutilating so-called trans children, his invitation to the LGBTQ set to co-opt his administration, his handling of COVID, and, and much more has been an absolute nightmare. More damage has been done to this country by Joe Biden than by any other president in recent memory, although he's running neck and neck with Obama, who started this up. I am genuinely frightened as a citizen of the prospect of four more years of Biden or a Democrat in the White House. <clears throat> that means I've made a context-dependent, strategic decision to support Donald Trump as a presidential candidate. I don't think it's hard to understand. I'm choosing the lesser of two evils. And anyone who's listening to this right now makes those same kinds of choices every day in their lives. We're not different. I'm not off the rails. I'm not doing something extreme here. I think that I've been presented with two suboptimal options, and I'm picking the one that I think is going to do better for us. Doesn't mean I, I know for sure that I'm right. I don't. I do believe, given the choices available, that Trump is the better choice today. I also leave open the possibility that he can do a lot of good. Uh, you know, I remember examining his actual policy acts in office when my, my, the worst of my Trump derangement syndrome began to wear off. And I started looking at his actual record and comparing it to what the Democrats were doing and saying. And I realized that I supported many of Donald Trump's actions, not all of them, but many of them. And also, I'm not a Republican. I am not registered with any party. I used to be a registered. I was literally a card carrying Democrat. When I got rid of that, I didn't just jump over to the other side. I haven't registered with the Republican Party. I haven't registered with any party. And I can't predict the future, but I doubt that I'm going to be a registered party voter for anybody in the future. The candidate who best aligns with my views or who is the better of two bad choices is going to be the candidate who gets my vote, regardless of party. My issue with the Republicans um, is sort of the opposite of the issue I had with them back when I was a Democrat. I think they're weak. I think they're out of touch. I don't know how, I don't think they know how to fight effectively. They pick exactly the wrong cultural issues to fight on while ignoring the cultural issues that moral duty calls them to attend and they, they might actually be able to win and do good in the world for. So basically as a party, as politicians, I think the Republicans are feckless and weak. But today in 2024, I think the Democrats are more dangerous to every American citizen than the Republicans are to any particular demographic interest bloc. And to wrap this up, I think among some of the people who've made these remarks to me, I think I've detected among those women readers, when they're women, that they're particularly opposed to Trump because of how they believe that he views and treats women. And I understand this position. But I also think I detect that some of them may be upset with a commentator like me for not making their concerns my primary concerns when I decide who to support. It's almost as if there's a sense of betrayal. And this is, if I'm right about this, this is familiar to me as a gay guy who's had and lost many female friendships over the years. There's often been an element of well, you're one of the good men, you're one of the good gays, so I can't tolerate it when you don't see abortion or feminism or women's concerns exactly the way I do. Well, women's issues, or, or rather more feminist issues more particularly, are not my primary concern. I'm not gonna make them my primary concern. Abortion is not gonna be my primary concern. I'm not gonna vote based on abortion. Feminist desires will not be what drives my vote. Um, I have been so wrong about so many political and cultural issues over the years. Uh, believe me, becoming a conservative was the last thing I would have predicted for myself, but it happened. In 10 years or 20 years, I may revise my views radically again. There are issues I might change my mind about next month. 
If anything, the past 10 years has taught me not to think that any of my views are necessarily permanent or that my analyses are obviously correct and will be that way until the end of time. <clears throat> and I also know I can't please every reader or viewer, and I appreciate everybody uh, who listens, who reads, um, and who gives feedback, even if they think I'm full of it on something. I appreciate all of that. Um, but I hope that I've clarified my position for people who might be curious about it. Thank you for listening and watching. We'll see you next week.